someone asked this, I, I, the best question I got when I presented some of these things at Taliesin, one of the old Taliesin fellows just simply got up and said, okay, so what the hell does all that ugly stuff have to do with architecture? So. <laughs> Leave what? It is so ugly. The, well, some of the collection of essentially leftover garbage that is portrayed as modern art. When do you want to escape that and find something that's more rational? Um, well, I actually find that everything I showed you, I find beautiful. So, uh, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, I, I think that, and in fact, not only that, but I think there is a rationale to the way things are assembled that uh, might be, have a deeper logic, both aesthetic and physical, than the making of grids. You know, there's a, there's a great, great, great story that, um, that the architect Wolf Pricks used to tell, the partner in uh, Co-op Himmelblau, said that the real moment for them of, of revelation was when they were working with their engineer and the engineer said to them, you know, you're working so hard to make your buildings work. And that's because you as an architect have been taught that it's all about resolving the forces in as few members as possible. And you've got to get all those arrows pointing in the right way and get them all to line up and to get the whole diagram to zero out and then you have the perfect building. Whereas in reality, you could also just follow all those arrows, all those lines of force, and build all of them. And if you do it right, it might be as efficient or more efficient than trying to prop them all together and stabilize them all out in as few orthogonal members as you can. So, not always, but it certainly is possible that you can find a rationale that does not uh, come down to the abstraction and uh, value engineering of all the pieces of the building into the simplest forms or fewest forms possible. You don't have to live in these environments. Yeah. These environments should be, as you said, beautiful mm -hmm. and, and make our lives better. Mm -hmm. But if we're constantly living under the Gardner Expressway with trucks and everything rattling past us, sure, you can say there's a beauty in that. It's a, you know, the, uh, the music of the city. But if I go up north and I head into a bush and I find some where I can literally sit on a rock and watch the waves splash in a much better environment. So, sounds, sounds, good to, sounds good to me. You notice I didn't show the Gardner Expressway. Uh, I mean, that thing is horrible. It should tear it down immediately. Um, That's not how you look at it. No, I think, I think you can say that the Gardner Expressway is a socially divisive and environmentally disastrous um, relic from a previous era of traffic management that uh, has probably outlived its usefulness, uh, even though I'm sure it will take billions of dollars to do what is necessary in terms of undergrounding and rerouting it and all the things that would integrate it. But I, just to be clear, I'm not saying that things that are um, bad are good or something like that. I'm just saying that it would be interesting for instance, as a hypothetical, to say, okay, the Gardner's not going to go away, and there's tremendous development pressure, and all of the development tries to ignore the Gardner and put as much soundproof glass up as it can and find ways to turn its back on it and find ways to not confront it. Could you make an architecture, and there must be some student project, I'm sure somewhere has tried to do this, and I'd love to see it if anyone had. Well, you say, okay, the gardener is a reality. It's a horrible thing. What do you do with it? How can you handle it? So in, in answer to your question, yes, we can all escape out into the middle of nature, although it's getting harder and harder, and you have to travel further and further to get there. And when you go, you still have your cell phone with, it, with you, and it might very well ring. And by the way, you're also wearing a lot of chemical combinations in order to keep yourself warm there. But you can get out there. My sense is that once you come back, your world work as an architect is to look at everything that architects often don't look at, everything that I saw between downtown and Toronto here, 
and figure out what to do with it. So don't run away from it. Don't, don't, don't well, pray to it, but figure out what to do with it. That's a good, and to me, that's that's the question of architecture. That that is the question. That is the question of architecture. How do you change that? So some people say, well, you change that by trying to go back to a model of what, at least in the United States, of what small towns used to be in the 1920s, and we'll try to do it like that. Turns out that works for a few rich people, so now and then with good security guards, but has a lot of other problems. My question is. People want to live in larger and larger spaces if they possibly can. They want to have the freedom to move around. Could you think of a way of creating this world of sprawl that was environmentally not destructive and that was socially inclusive and open? I don't have an answer. I'm not saying I know how to. I think that this Frank Lloyd Wright guy, even though he got 90% of it wrong, started to have some good ideas when he started working on Broadacre City, and he was just about the only major American architect who has looked seriously at alternatives to sprawl uh, that accept the car and the spread. So I think we need to figure out what to do with it. Yeah, true, true. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you notice I'm not a licensed architect. So. <laughs> um, I, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. In fact, um, some people have proposed that the best work in architecture you could do is to rewrite the codes. And in fact, uh, Michael Sorkin a number of years ago wrote a book, uh, a, new, a New Building Code, which was only half in jest. Um, but the, the only serious answer I can get that beyond, beyond saying that's why I think that architecture maybe should not worry so much about buildings because it's impossible uh, to make architecture if you follow all the codes and you have to follow the codes because we don't want to kill people and we do want things to get built in a way that are commodious in some manner um, is to figure out how you can work your way through codes and that's a really, really tough thing. But if you want to take that on, then I'm going to be showing your architecture 10 years from now. So, yes? Now you say you don't want to kill people. Uh, what does it actually be? <laughs> uh, <laughs> a good idea to actually create that. Uh, right now, we're in Canada. We are experimenting with a whole new attitude towards euthanasia. Mm. Uh, we're we're mm. running behind many other countries still a little bit ahead of the US with the exception of Oregon. But wouldn't it actually uh, be a good idea to actually start creating code-free zones, sue-free zones, to actually start to say as an experiment, you know, we're going to assign to the city of Cambridge, uh, we're going to say the code will be slowly abolished here over a 10-year period, and in the meantime, uh, the uh, civil law will cease to apply that, that various lawsuits you could uh, initiate against officials or others for wrongful death right. will actually not apply. And we are going to create pockets in this otherwise overly regulated society where all of this will be possible at your own risk. Yeah, you sign the waiver and all that. It's interesting. There actually have been experiments uh, in that direction. Uh, and there are ways that you can if you create um, a community under a certain amount of people, even under current code in some states in America, uh, uh, break through the cro codes and do things that otherwise wouldn't follow it. Um, it's, it's tricky. I wouldn't know how, how far to take that. But I think that's, that, that is one very good example. I'll give you a concrete example, not directly in terms of building, but in terms of uh, traffic management. Uh, which is actually a Dutch example uh, of something they, they did that, that certainly makes me think that there would be some value in going in some of this direction. 
there's a traffic engineer in the north of the Netherlands who has been working for years on how to reduce uh, traffic uh, accidents and fatalities and all that kind of stuff. And he finally got one municipality to try this experiment where the first thing they did is they went to the bu one of the busiest corners in the, in, in the town and they took away not only all the traffic lights and all the traffic signs, but all of the distinction between the paving. So you couldn't tell where the road stopped and where the sidewalk st stopped. And traffic accidents plummeted because when you're in that kind of environment, your first uh, impulse is to slow down. You become completely unsure, and when you become unsure, you become aware. And one of the reasons that people have, there now is a fair amount of scientific study, one of the problems with codes is that it's like any kind of drug, you keep needing more of them, because the more handrails and all these slip-free surfaces you have, the less aware people become of their environment, and the more they rely on all of those crutches. So when you take some of those crutches away, it actually sometimes can help. Now, whether we'll just learn to say no to all codes, I don't know. But those kind of experiments, to me, are, are fascinating. And, and I'd love to, love to see more of those. Yes? Aaron, I, I'm quite overwhelmed and, <laughs> and, and delighted with, with what you've offered us. And I'm, I'm especially struck by the sheer optimism and, and the fertility mm. of sense of enabling us to, to say yes in a tremendous kind of ec ecumenical gathering defined by some delicious words, <laughs> emplacement, uh -huh. enseignment. Uh -huh. I, do, I do have a, a pair of questions. Uh-oh, now about, here it comes. About, 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 about that gathering. Uh -huh. In the sense that on, on one hand, in in, in such an apparent plurality and, and a, a gathering of, fer, of fertility, the efflorescence of, of the materials, I mean, mm -hmm. the sheer efflorescence yeah. of, of materials in, in, in the rules of physics can <laughs> lead to entropy, which then becomes mm. saturated, which, mm. then, which then turns into a kind of Banality. absolute homogeneity, yep. not necessarily banality, but, but, but most, most certainly a radical saturation which produces a kind of stasis when Jackson Pollock can go mm -hmm. no further. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder whether, whether, you can, whether you can speculate about some strategies to navigate that. And the, se the second question, which is perhaps related, is to, to go to, to your first provocation, the other pole from, from this beautiful emplacement in the consumer, where you declared evil, <laughs> uh, evil as the imposition of abstract form on banality. And you gave us, without judgment, but sort of implicitly, a whole chocolate box of recent examples mm -hmm. across the scene mm -hmm. as, a, as a tremendous, you know, a real damning provocation about, about, about some contemporary practices of art as well. Could, could you speak about evil? And could you speak about that navigation? It's a really, it's a, that's a, a fabulous question. Um, as, as I wouldn't expect otherwise. Um, I think, uh, I, I was going to write a book, and I still hope someday going to, I'm going to write a book, about called Nothing. Actually, I can't write it called Nothing because there's a great book about the invention of nothing. Um, uh, and the invention of zero and the invention of one point perspective and their relationship. But I think that several things. First of all, there's a difference between um, uh, uh, erasive minimalism and dense minimalism, which is to say there is that minimalism which interests me less which is an, 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 uh, a minimalism that comes by laying the flat white plane on the world, drawing a grid on it, and starting from there. What does interest me is 
like the work I showed in the Belgian Pavilion, that attempt to figure out what is there and to reorganize it in, re, in such a manner that it implodes in on itself so that the form that is minimal is actually the compaction, exactly in the manner that you say, of everything that went into it, all the colors coming into white rather than white having been painted on top of it. Uh, and, and that is the kind of work that interests me. But there's a related thing which you said, which is, of course, um, the confrontation with evil, which, of course, also means that you're mirroring yourself in that evil. And this is where things get um, philosophical. And I'm really hesitate, hesitating, given <laughs> who's sitting next to you, to, to really start talking about this. Uh, but, but as some of you might have noticed, a lot of the, work, the words I use I have, a, have a Heideggerian um, derivation. Which, which already puts me in, in dangerous territory. But there is, to, to go further in that territory, there is that sense that one confronts one's own absence, one's own non-existence. Um, and then one can only hope for this, what Heidegger called this veil, uh, that it might appear. And that somehow what it is that one becomes, becomes reflected in that veil. Um, let me try to dial that down a little bit. Um, if we are really going to work with and understand not just the Gardner Expressway, but the Dominion Center, uh, which is to say if we're going to work with, reuse, rethink, what we already have, we have to understand that much of it um, has a, uh, a destructive nature to it, both, again, environmentally, aesthetically, but also in its social organization. And tearing it down and creating play places within it is not going to do it. We actually have to figure out how to work through it how to work with it, how to work underneath it, uh, how to unbuild it. And that means, to a certain extent, becoming part of it, which I don't know how. And I think it does go back to this question of, of confronting the ugliness. But I do think that we, we have to um, realize um, what it is, what the world is we're, re we're working in, in both senses of that word. I don't know if that answers your question, but. That's a beautiful watch. <laughs> Take one more. Um, I also really enjoyed your lecture. Um, and I, I also enjoyed its operation a lot. And I guess my, my question is really about, it seems so positive and so, and so critical at the same time. But what about, what are the politics underlying? Am I a commie yes, pinko radical? Philip's, yeah. Philip's question um, made me think a little bit about postmodernism. Like that somehow, in a funny way, what, you, what you're saying here that seems so radical to us, given like, you know, the chocolate box that Philip talked about, is not very different from what maybe Colin Rowe Oh, no, absolutely. In the 70s, right? So there's a certain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're kind of, there's a certain reprise here. And, and when I think about the kinds of critiques of the politics of uh -huh. postmodernism, Certainly, the left critiques like uh -huh. Jameson or Harvey. Yeah, or, yeah. Um, I'm wondering. That's kind of where I'm wondering about the politics of it. Like, it's... on the one hand, I sympathize with them entirely, and I'm really excited about them. But they're also a bit unclear. You, you guys are really good. You're like getting to all of the all of the really difficult points of what I'm trying to talk about. I, on a completely banal level, yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, I actually, I, I, I want to have. I, I documented. About seven or eight years ago, I wrote an article that postmodernism is coming back, and by golly, it has. And we're, we're beginning to learn that actually Michael Gray's was not such a bad architect. <laughs> uh, and you, you all, all you students, you should go back and look at San Juan Capistrano uh, Library by Michael Gray's, one of the most 
beautiful buildings that you know it's been ignored for too long because of our association and because of exactly the way that postmodernism, like every single attempt by architecture to establish a critical uh, role for itself, was immediately appropriated and turned into the reverse and became Michael Gray's building for Disney, which is a banal way of getting at you. On a more philosophical level, you're absolutely right. The other great influence on a lot of what I'm saying it comes out of a misreading of Tafuri and the sense that, in fact, we are confronted with the empty sign. We are confronted with the impossibility of doing anything. That the notion that you can av avoid architectures through revolution, as Le Corbusier would have a, a tell us, is not only dead, but so is the notion of making architecture through revolution. And that instead we are left with the debris, the leftover, the fragments of previous revolts, and trying to make our lives within it, and trying to confront uh, what our lives are within that, and trying to figure out a radical set of tactics out of exactly those remains and debris. And you're absolutely right. The major exhibition of the Shenzhen Biennale will be called Collage City 3D, uh, and it will be a three-dimensional, uh, site-specific, collaborative installation uh, that will attempt to build on Colin Rowe's discussion that what we need to look at is not the buildings but the scaffolding and that the scaffolding is really where things start. So uh, postmodernism lives. Postmodernism was not either a retrograded movement, though it certainly had that built into it from the very start, nor was it a consumerist reaction to the honest production of form, as other people claimed, uh, but I think it made us aware um, as many people have pointed out since then, that the moment of modernism, the moment of realization of the new is past in both senses of that word, and that we fig have to figure out what to do with that moment of past, and that, that therein lies the field of architecture, lies the potential of architecture. And by the way, a lot of that stuff is really beautiful, and you can do something with it. So. On that note, uh, well, I think we have to wrap up. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.